Hello everyone, today we talk about the Burgundian army and more specifically of its so-called uniforms that uh, more or less anachronistically we can start to talk about for the 15th century. Uh, we already made some videos about uh, the Burgundian army and one that is pretty close to it which should be like flags and banners of the Burgundian army or something like that. Um, we will take a look at flags uh, briefly today as well, um, inserting them into the general um, overview on the, you know, on the function of this kind of uniformity that you can see both in the uh, equipment uh, in, in general and in the flags and banners. Um, but we will stick chiefly on, on clothing or at least what was put over, sometimes even over armor. Uh, of course, um, to um, in, into this process of uh, progressive um, s standardization uh, that was at this time kind of it's we can't even say at the very beginnings there, there is the general picture you can trace where what we think as modern standardization uh, is something that uh, starts roughly in the the Thirty Years War, especially in the Swedish army, but. Um, you can, looking back at the history, you can always spot into armies a certain degree of um, uniformity, of sen a standardization that was seeked for uh, chiefly very practical reasons. Uh, first of all, strictly tactical ones, that is to identify which is the specific, you know, which specific unit it is, that one you see on the battlefield, but also to to give more, there is also much of uh, we we discussed this, much of the of, of psychological to it as well. I mean, being part of a uniform, colorly uniformed um, uh, group is is somewhat um, empowering. Uh, it even creates uh, it's kind of can be even fearsome for the enemy that watches you, etc. But today w I would like to concentrate the topic chiefly on the um, on the very on the partiality, let's say, of the um, of this um, standardization, let's say, and and how effectively Burgundian armies in 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 weren't that massively uniformed, so that they they rightfully uh, won their place in history as well for, as well as for many other things into uh, into this fifteenth century for this uh, kind of um, tendency towards an uh, kind of pre-annunciation what would have become uh, modern warfare in this progressive centralization and dependency on the state of the uh, side of the armed forces um, but at the same time it was still a medieval army and the degree of uniformity and standardization was pretty pretty low and also the uh, this standardization is something that mostly emerges from the um, from the fifth, at the beginning of the 15th century, where the Ottomans are starting to issue this kind of uniformity, um, and we will see how even the symbols kind of varied over time on how things were issued, but not quite um, had on, on the battlefield. Uh, unfortunately, we, we don't know how it really was, but we have many uh, evidence in general about even. What, what these armies looked l kind of like, right? Um, and we can spot that there was a, a, something new going on, but still there were many persistences from, from the per previous um, period. So, in general, looking at this army, uh, you, you know, there were cer certain major um, signs of distinction in Burgundian army. Probably the most famous one is St. Andrew's Cross, worn um, by, um, that had been uh, adopted as the Burgundian field sign um, uh, by uh, 14, 16 circa, at the latest, right? And this was made up um, of two ragged staffs, crossed in saltire fashion, but um, also sometimes appeared as they, they appeared as crossed arrows on flags right and um and it, this was worn um on clothes actually and it was also pro more probably in this case like a, a, a like a plain cross so officially j just this level of distinction um that was enough because if the problem 
is just, you know, being part of a unit. Normally units recognize themselves through banners, right? And and at this point in history, it's not that, that there was an excessive confusion about this. Obviously, the, um, the lack of uniformity brought uh, uh, to the need of this, but the, 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 the lack of uniformity had also kind of been the average because the tactical dynamism of the field didn't quite require this form of, um, of identification. By the way, you can disguise the enemy. Uh, pretty easily also in, in in the era of uniforms, by the way, without mentioning that the uniform as such is a pretty, um, you know, evanescent element in, in itself. I mean, meaning that a uniform, you may have even a uniform, but after two months of campaign, this is normally something that has completely worn itself out. So these symbols of recognition, especially on, on the individual soldier, were something more oriented to okay not to to be identified on, on the field even as a form of security for whoever could attack you usually there were kind of code words as well that if you code some enemies you 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 you, you could verify that there were such if you, by asking them this word so the the general evolution of of this uniform in practice actually stems from the increased uh, centralization that you can start to find in these princely states uh, towards the, the the 15th century, of which Burgundy is definitely one of the greatest representatives. I mean, Burgundy wasn't at this time quite the uh, really the most effective army around. Uh, there would be a, a huge debate about this. I mean, not mean not meaning that uh, you know it, it doesn't even matter at this point which was, but obviously if you look at the French. Or the Venetians, or um, or even the Swiss, especially that were the the, r the real forerunners at that point. It would, the, the Swiss didn't have much of a uniformity; still, they had this kind of mono arm tactics that worked pretty effectively against the Burgundian army, which was increasingly more, um, I mean, way more specialized than the Swiss. The Swiss basically had only pikemen infantry. Yeah, they they were starting to have like uh, gunners, and there was some crossbowmen scatter around, but it was a mono-arm thing. Even some cavalry around, but everything was done by the phalanx. Uh, let's say. In, in, the, in the case of the Burgundian army, the problem is to, 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 to really grasp how this system... I mean, much of the criticism you can move towards this system in that it, it effectively was defeated so, repeatedly uh, during the, this, not just during this, the the Swiss, um, the the wars against the Swiss that were kind of the brought to the collapse of the same Burgundy, the death of of, of Charles the Bold, that had been effectively the one who who, who had um, uh, enhanced the most this this military system of the Ordonnance. The Ordonnance would be um, just uh, an order, right? Uh, these were kind of uh, dispositions that were emanated every once in a while that were it already existed in France, right? And we will see, in fact, on how enemy elements of uniformation in the Burgundian army were kind of inherited by even by French practice by by a certain degree, especially at the beginning, before starting to develop something more. Uh, autonomous in this sense. So nothing was quite new, but the ordinance were, however, now uh, aimed at achieving this degree of. Uh, there were a regulamentation wanted to 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 cover all to, to encompass all the aspects of the uh, of uh, this um, of this life. So everything like from from obviously the uniforms, but also the the order, the equipment. Um, the, the service duties, the billeting, and everything, and it, it's uh, as, uh, they are remarkably important sources. We will have to take a look at them eventually and singularly because some of them are really very detailed in a moment in history where you don't find this much around. Burgundy was on the lead in this, and 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 was taking a bit uh, from the best of all the military organizations in many ways, and even the Burgundian armies were. A set not just of different tactical specializations, but also of different nationalities. In their armies, uh, there weren't just French. There were, there were uh, Italians. There were Germans. There were English, um, and uh, so you find in here a great deal of in this kind of 
um, renaissance, we can say at this point, especially by the second half of the 15th century Europe, that the military um, knowledge and practices and techniques were pretty much shared. So what this has to be looked like, it's not really the singular, um, I mean, from, from the singular modification it's really about the dual picture, that is, that Burgundy was uh, a very advanced state, was pretty rich, it had this pretty solid resources of Burgundy, it was pretty, uh, an agriculture center of, of great importance, the wealth of the Flemish cities that had been progressively conquered by the, du the um, dukes of, of Burgundy during the uh, the 14th and the 15th century so the word kind of summing up a bit of the best even in terms of know-how of, of material um, Burgundy was kind of a mostly rural and um, and, um, and 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 kind of feudal uh, region while Flanders were kind of more uh, communal and and urban and and, and 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 technologically developed, also financially developed. So the, the, the dukes of Burgundy were quite clever, and they were kind of picking the best all of these systems and trying to put them them together. So financial wealth, that as always is the um, you know what makes the whole thing works first, and then this association, this um, a development of of the ver of various tactical specialties and putting them together and trying especially to stress the uniformity and sometimes this is um, it's even in the end passes too much on the foreground like the idea oh look at these guys were kind of uniform in the system so this means that it was kind of a mo more modern system and in, in, even in, in tactical effectiveness but most of the time it's actually it's not quite the case I mean even talking about um, I don't know the armies of uh, of the Nassau in the the end of the 16th century. Much is said. Oh, look at these guys! They are uniforming thing. They're trying to do the thing like in the modern way, right? But it wasn't quite like that. I mean, this positivistic um, identification of several stages of progress that every uh, that kind of uh, mm, kills a little bit the 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 importance of the general picture and when you see when you see a lot of back and forth a lot of um, sometimes of, uh, also of of scarce evidence like it's not that we know much about the Burgundian army for example and it's uh, we know much in relative terms as we said before but even if you look at what happened on the field you realize that this system at the end of the day as um, you know sophisticated as it may appear it was however not effective, or at least, yeah, you can give that they, these um, the, the, these troops were fighting against the Swiss that would become pretty soon the model of a Renaissance warfare, at least in infantry, square pikes, etc., um, and that everybody started coming from them. But um, it, it's, um, I believe that such crushing defeats cannot be attributed exclusively say nor to bad luck nor to the fact that these were guys were fighting against the finest um, tactical system of the time or at least the, the, the most effective one um, in the in, in practice but you have probably to to realize that all this alleged moder modernization was just kind of putting a bit together all these elements but the gluing factor probably was was not so much there. Also because um, the it is true that military reforms usually happen for uh, you know through the mind of people who kind of understand what what the, what the evolution of the system is. And definitely the Burgundian army was was trending towards what would become the the, no the novelty, the most effective system. But at the same time, you cannot think that um, just the reform is is something you can make uh, can make work everything by itself. All uh, armies evolve by themselves. Let's abandon this modernistic myth of the reformer that somewhat somehow invents what nobody had ever thought before. When you look at military reforms, you realize that basically the, the overwhelming part of the change had already taken place, um, and that uh, what was invented seemingly at the time was something maybe of several centuries old. 
uh, a couple of centuries old even uh, at that point. So uh, in the case of Burgundy, it's probably this case that probably some in terms of military administration of central control had been effectively uh, improved, but that in terms of quali of tactical tactical effectiveness, all this deployment wasn't quite uh, functional, at least not as much to present uh, military innovation that uh, at that point was was abandoned because the Burgundian army was effectively a, a, by approximation what we can call a, a, a medieval army. It was this um, element of combined tactics uh, still in the kind of the old way, right? All the elements that you find in here are um, basically something very similar to what had existed up from 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 the first century. Not a huge innovation. Um, the tac this uh, the Swiss tactical system was something very different very different in its functionality and it stemmed from a s uh, let's say um a structure system that had already that had the 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 basis for for and the reasons for having developed like that i know it sounds a bit foggy and actually i'm a great admirer of the burgundian army i think i always look at the feats first of all saying but uh, is it really true that you know these guys got defeated because they were kind of bad or they, they were weak or they there was something seriously wrong into them well uh, it's important it's a, a very important question to ask but at the same time military history um is the only answer we have most of the times in in really in terms of how we know about the systems so if these guys were crashed um uh, continuously uh, at this point um it, the, 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 there's must have been something that are, although and obviously contextualizable and, and 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 that has to be contextualized um is still pretty meaningful in its outcome and, and it, it it has at least not to be dismissed like just talking theory like as if this wasn't really anything so this was a, a bit important to frame the whole picture and the uh, keeping going on on the uh, the other kind of kind of colors of the uh, uniforms clothing etc um the saint andrew's cross actually was to be was supposed at least by the ordonnance to be worn by all troops right but as we were saying before a mm, reasonable uh, number of contemporary pictures actually show burgundian troops without so um this is more normal in my opinion and and still the ordnance armies weren't the only ones the, Bur the dukes of burgundy actually filled it it was full of other troops coming from other communities that were still at the base uh at of the if not of the bulk uh of the uh of the uh, tactical element proper uh, or at least to the critical uh, mass from terms of what what ha was what happening in the fight in combat still were um, in terms of logistical terms etc crucial and they were always there like in form of uh, troops sent by the various uh, cities and their corporations etc and those maintained a pretty large degree of deformity actually especially the the city contingents were extremely diverse, and even within the uh, the the armies of the Ordonnance, you find that there there was, as as it was normal in any medieval army at this point, um, to have this kind of distinction on the base of where you came from. We'll see now, uh, for instance, the the Dijon um, band on on the on the sleeves and. For the the troops of the city of Dijon and all this kind of stuff that probably existed largely also uh, in, in other elements of the same order the nuns, not the ones that were called from kind of more autonomous um, recruitment, uh, say military systems of organization from the various communities. Um, the 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 cross uh, it was mostly uh, either red, uh, less often yellow. Uh, while um, a later 15th century source depicts a um, a Burgundian trooper at the siege of Orléans in 1428-29 wearing a dark blue cross, right? So that's sometimes all we can rely on. So, uh, in addition to the cross, um, after in 1471. 
um, there were there were kind of um, me party uniforms of blue and white that are normally what you see depicted in fact in the latest stage in, in the triad of defeats of the, the Burgundians against the Swiss um, so blue and white these were mostly the, the colors you would find um, um, both by the the infantry and the mounted troops in the ordinance companies right? um, and the the uh, sometimes this the, the cross was uh, embroidered on the front other times um, um, it probably also on the back by certain it, it depends but seemingly it was li less frequent um, and the m there were also other um, dispositions like uh, in the same ordinance of uh, 1471 you, uh, you have the um, the Burgundian men at arms to uh, obliged to wear at least issued to wear blue and white plumes on their helmets as well, and even this I see the horses by the way on their heads with their their armor and uh, vermilion velvet crosses on their armor as well. Mm -hmm. So it's usually these colors were blue and white with certain uh, red. Um, uh, details or kind of distinguishing factors, including the cross, preferably, which is also kind of reasonable because red or or yellow, as we've seen, are kind of you know pretty um, pretty identifiable. They're, they're bright colors, you know, that you can uh, see them more more clearly, especially contrasting with blue uh, with white. So this also has to do with the the visual thing. Also, consider what what a battle could transform this. These uniforms into with dirt, blood, and all this stuff, but it, it was still kind of it, as we've said, it wasn't quite vital at this point to recognize what was on the field. But generally speaking, there were also any other times in more recent times where uniforms make, became kind of a uh, of a must. You know, the uh, effectively the uh, still it was mostly about the banner that identified. Um, certain uh, uh, unit, etc., rather, rather than the the colors, the colors proper. And we, as we've said before, by the way, this issues doesn't mean that um, like where uh, like blue and white uh, clothes with red crosses, etc., were all produced in the same fashion. Mm? It could be possible. Usually, at this time, you know, if you look at consider the, the means of productions, etc., you of production, you see that. Um, the, there is a certain degree of uniformity, of, of course, achieved, but every soldier was sometimes even meant given the, literally the the colored cloth, and then uh, had some tailor uh, making the, the uniform out of those clothes, and and the cross was something probably, I don't know whether if added because sometimes, by the way, this was issued even on cuirasses and so on. So this was not just sewn on 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 clothes, but it was sometimes also. Um, part of a something you could apply in the arm on armor, which usually actually was even covered in some velvet or or other stuff um, by by itself. Armors at this time were all colored, like uh, painted. Um, of course, yeah, there, there was the taste of looking, you know, this um, army uh, like this this uh, armor to be so polished that it looked kind of white, not even gray or silver, but white proper. Um, to to uh, reflect all, all light, etc. But many many armors at this time were painted or covered with uh, some textile, and the whole business of war was pretty co colorful colorful at this time. In the you know the idea of the full plate armor that that now is becomes kind of the most uh, precious and um, iconic element of of 15th century battlefields is still to be accompanied by these other details um, let's say so looking back however <laughs> excuse me this was the kind of the bare and uh, an easier uh, way of looking at the thing like what is that the ordinance issues and you know what it should what these uh, soldiers should look like but Going a little back and re, you know re watching the, the whole thing and how it developed, I think it can help to to happen how how the whole thing kind of uh, developed. First of all, 
Philip the, the Bold officially took possession of the Duchy of Burgundy in June 1364. And at, at this point he uh, he had already held a review of the ducal troops at Châtillon uh, in, in August 1363. Um, and, and from here, we already uh, we have information about this, uh, even it's about what this kind of troops, uh, what these troops kind of looked like. And um, the uh, the first elements we can see immediately the white cross of France, um, uh, either painted on the mail shirt or some with some brigandine or support. So the um, it, it should be always remembered. That the Burgundian, uh, the Burgundian, uh, the Bur Burgundy itself was a, a French duchy, right? So when we talk about Burgundy, you have to always pay attention not to f to confuse um, ancient Burgundy that was like the, what what eventually was became known as a kingdom proper, was part of the Holy Roman Empire, as a kingdom um, separate from France, also known uh, known as Kingdom of Arles that it is still existed this time by the way by name but it was completely empty in terms there was no effective monarchy there the title was usually held by the the holy roman emperor um and and when we talk about burgundy it's another thing it is true uh, and it was this french duchy that belonged not to the burgundian kingdom but to the western frankish kingdom later the french kingdom and albeit it is true that uh, certain uh, uh, Along the borders, uh, that that you know, Bur Duchy of Burgundy, the, the Burgundy as the historical region of France, borders Burgundy, and there were cer certain minor, uh, certain territories that uh, at one time were part of the Kingdom of Burgundy. They also were encompassed by the Duchy afterwards. Still, there's there there are two very different things. There were a few territories. And they were inherited in different ways, and there is no relation of like affiliation between the two things. So the Burgundians were a uh, French duchy, and actually uh, the, the 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 Burgundian dynasty was starting in the 14th, 15th century was 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 French part of the French royalty was the the Valois Burgundy, right? And an owed allegiance to the French king which was perfectly normal and things got seriously messed up into this during the Hundred Years War where France was in a pretty uh, pitiful state at one point and the Burgundian dukes they were pretty powerful and had great um, let's say interest to counterbalance in this sense the power of French crown internally at one point sided with the English famously a Burgundian army at the end marched even on Paris they, they were this were by the way the, the Burgundian dynasty was extremely warlike the Burgundian um, the house of, of Valois Burgundy was um, was considered actually the most chivalrous one in Europe at the same time also the command of several crusades were entrusted to them against the Ottomans even with kind of as we know as miserable consequences um, but they were kind of they invent, they they established the order of the golden fleece they 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 did uh for a lot of they were extremely passionate about tournaments they were wealthy they had a court so they also even the etiquette and it was more elaborated in burgundy than than it was in france in itself that already was considered the uh chivalric um kingdom pro pro excellence in western christianity and um so th there was this rivalry that uh, as we've seen actually escalated into open warfare and this enmity uh, continued until the end of the 15th century when uh, france um, managed to to expel the english uh, presence from the uh, from the continent except from from calais as it's uh, acknowledged and the next target was Burgundy, uh, but the problem is that Burgundy was quite of a power. So actually, what happened is that um, obviously there were lots of schemes uh, happening, all the, the international politics revolving, you know, what the Burgundian duke was doing. Because by the way, the Burgundians were seeking allies from everywhere because having having the French um, a monarchy by neighbor with with all the army that they were developing at their time with their cavalry and artillery. Albeit the Burgundians kind of developed artillery kind of before the French uh, in in importance, but um, it's not a, a very good thing. So the Burgundians now were 
uh, and, and this partly reflects on, on their military uh, developments, they were kind of um, um, tying relations with several other um, powers out there. Um, and um, at the end of the day, the Burgundians tried to expand. First, they they went into into Germany, uh, failing and actually achieving a, uh, an alliance with the Habsburgs that will famously bring to the matrimonial tie with the daughter of uh, of Charles the, the Bold with with the um, uh, with Maximilian and the uh, and therefore the inheritance of the um, the the the, Abs uh, the 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 Burgundian inheritance of the Habsburg in the Habsburg possession will change basically the the whole rest of European history until <coughs> until World War uh, um, the first. I mean, not because of the Burgundian legacy, but what it, what it allowed the Habsburgs to do up to that point. But basically, the as we've said before, the Burgundians get destroyed de facto and their and their duke killed in battle by this, uh, with, during the Swiss Wars. So the, the Swiss at this point have even some kind of uh, desire to, to, to seize terrors and they make it, but the bigger po powerful out there in the, in the open was, was France, and France basically um, in, uh, seizes all these territories uh, except for the uh, the Bur from, from from the Burgundian Flanders and some other like the French Comte, but that's also complicated to 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 um, to analyze. Maybe one day we will make a video to to explain that because it's actually very complicated. Uh, all the various territories, etc. So at that point, Burgundy disappears, and um, or better, it's it's uh, conquered by the French. Or reconquered, as you wanna wanna see it, was mostly a kind of a dynastic um, problem at that point, rather than a matter of pertinence. Because, by the way, however, many uh, the the Burgundians had expanded into territories that um, ex uh, went, you know, had surpassed the, the the same French boundaries. They had entered into the Holy Roman Imperial lands. That's also why partly the French didn't quite um, uh, absorb. Uh, er all of the Burgundian state it was very composite, however, as as it's, as it's understandable at this point. Um, and uh, so, this permanence of the White Cross of France is something you find up to the beginning of 15th century. So, these were behaving like even using a, a degree of uniformity that even clearly already existed into the French kingdom, and that was referential to the same French crown. In fact. The same, uh, the same Saint Andrew's Cross, was to appear as uh, the military um, emblem of Burgundy into the early 15th century. I mean, before it, uh, it wasn't there, and it was adopted, as a matter of fact, as the result of the civil war within in, in, the same, within the same uh, French uh, at that point. So to distinguish the various um, factions, the, the, the various parts. In, into that conflict between the Armagnacs and, in fact, in the Bourgogne. Um, so, um, looking at the the um, this was um, you know this moment of passage. Looking at other at the beginning of fifteenth century proper, um, we um, you start seeing. By the way, um, think that uh, before we were saying that. Um, Men at arms were starting being I issued in the in the seventies, uh, uh, say in the second half of the fifteenth century, to wear this kind of uniform colors, right? But uh, up to that point, actually, the uh, uh, first of all, the same Burgundian dukes were kind of changing their own their own coat of arms because at every generation, by matrimonial ties. New uh, lands, new titles were incorporated, so this uh, coat of arms became, uh, hardly, um, hardly speaking, more, more ever more complex. And even uh, these symbols that eventually would become kind of iconic of the same, of the same uh, Burgundian power were not invented yet. And men at arms that were at this time the bulk of the. Um, of the European armies in terms of um, 
of tactical strength and this critical mass, etc. were quite versatile, etc. Europe is getting refutalized in the second half of the 14th century and the 15th before the say the last part that was heading speedingly towards this um, emergence of professional infantries um, that obviously were not noblemen, right? At least no, not the most of them. The case of Spain, sometimes you find lots of what the was the Spanish gentry uh, participating on foot. We even made a video about that. But uh, overall, the, the, the here and as we've said, Burgundy was like one of the exam the best um, examples of, of of chivalry in Europe. So the name of nobility, its uh, military importance, and also the political and social one was pretty much out there. So every, every noble. At, at to that point had worn his own um, coat of arms on his surcoat, right? Um, you c could wear with a surcoat, sometimes you could wear it with... Um, the surcoat was, you know, used since, uh, you know, the now what by several centuries as this uh, vest over the over armor. It was particularly important to be recognized in your herald like, uh, heraldic symbols, etc. Too, because it was a matter of honor. Fundamentally, these uh, men at arms were expected to go into the thick of the mist, no, no matter what. So, at one point, it was even a, a form of precaution to be recognized, because uh, instead of being killed, you could be identified for the the, the quite prized noble that you were, and could be ransomed, and it's better than than dead. Uh, of course, so it, it's even interesting in the seventies of the fifteenth century to see that the the men at arms they definitely were not old noblemen at all, actually, but that some of them were gaining some power. There were some even social ambition, etc. Were issued uniformity even on that sense. Um, so it, it's kind of the the subtle idea take, taking some form, uh, some sort of shape, right? Um, and therefore, framing this um, elements not just into a kind of a tactical um, um, yeah, identification, but also into a sort of political order, right? as it was crystallizing at that time in Europe. Um, uh, we uh, the 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 ducal accounts of Burgundy for fourteen o nine show the following in uh, entry uh, to furnish for one month 30 armed men and 15 crossbowmen dressed and ready to go to the siege of uh, Villexon for one own and a half of uh, vermilion cloth from which were cut the letters Dijon put on the sleeve of each jack and two own of white cloth on which were put the said letters in the form of a scroll. This is from the communal archives of Dijon. Now the own, first of all, is a f uh, that we will see now, especially when talking about the dimensions of of the banners. is a, It was a unit of measure, of cloth usually. Uh, it's it's the equivalent of the English L, and uh, it, it seemingly was standardized to 45 inches. But I will, we will see now. At least in case of banners, if you look at the measures, that you know, if you were to 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 stay to this equivalency, these banners would have been ridiculously big. So it it was probably something closer to 15 inches, something like that. <coughs> Anyhow, um, so in other words, what we have just read tells us that these troops that were to be sent, and you see here that there aren't actually many. Right, they are like thirty armed men and fifteen crossbowmen. They have to have to wear on their for for the siege of Vélexon. So this was this also tells so much about how military um, per, uh, services were requested. Still, you know, in a relatively contained fashion, were to wear this uh, in th this um, cloth on which th these letters were uh, indicating. Uh, the the city of 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 of, um, of origin were to be Britain, right? And this was a way to control them. It's a way to say, okay, these are the troops that 
um, came from Dijon or whatever that they were obliged to do. Um, and uh, it's interesting because it passes, in fact, through the uniform, into a sort of uniform, or at least a reconnaissance uh, element, right? Um, and um, it's interesting that we know that by the 15th, the beginning of the 15th century, there were still uh, troopers, maybe of secondary uh, importance, like gunners, for instance, that uh, wore the White Cross of France. So these were kind of old jackets that um, were still in use uh, before the Franco Burgundian relations deteriorated up to that point. And as we said before, this is instead the moment in which they start getting replaced by the uh, by Saint Andrew's Cross of uh, of Burgundy, right? Uh, that was getting adopted as the Duchy's emblem. Um, relatively to this, um, it, it sh it's worth while noting that the uh, this u uniformity started chiefly from the um, from the troops that were kind of uh, engaged. Um, tactically in a kind of a more direct way, meaning that if you were to look at gunners, um, probably, you know, that's that's the place where in the artillery the least uniformity can, was needed. Because the artillery is the artillery, it stays there. Of course, we were reading uh, just um, some days ago about the, the battle of um, the uh, one of the battles of the uh, Hundred Years' War, where uh, the, it was so the same, more or less the same times now, um, where uh, the Battle of Formigny, where uh, cannons were even engaged in first line uh, be, uh, in front of the of the enemy lines. But this, the crews were usually not to fight. But so, in that sense, th they were exposed and could even need to be recognized, not even to escape, because the problem is also desertion. You know, if you if you wear this uh, issued thing, you you know that you belong to that unit. So even you, you're automatically recognized by the enemy as as such, in reverse. Um, but uh, this uh, uniforms were newly new uniforms were probably way more widespread among the uh, those who were fighting in the first line, habitually. And uh, naturally, the nobility in heavy cavalry, so the most important tactical element, would wear the stuff uh, more, uh, even without being issued, actually. So you want to show you're a Burgundian, that you serve your duke, you have these uh, emblems, etc., so aside just from your own. Uh, that's a, a matter of prestige, of a symbol of allegiance, uh, etc. For what it concerns the regular troops like infantry, or lighter cavalry that that were probably would start being issued more like like a necessity because these troops wouldn't do it by themselves. We were kind of poor. They were kind of hired just for that. They there were many. They were also probably the most dynamic tactical element in the sense that they they were more mobile. They needed to prepare even pave pave the road for the the, the heavier cavalry. Um, so they were the ones that probably required this uniformity to to happen uh, uh, the, the earliest uh, in it. Um, and in terms of heraldry uh, etc if you're, if you're interested there is some of the most beautiful uh, pictures of knights uh, of these times in the uh, book by uh, An Officier d'Armes of the Burgundian court which is known f famously as the uh, uh, Armorial Equestre de l'Europe et de la Toison d'Or. Mm. So this is the uh, the Equestrian Armory of Europe and of the Golden Fleece, <coughs> uh, dated to 1450, circa mid 15th century. Um, and in here, the Duke Philip is represented in this uh, kind of turn, actually tournament. Um, joust um, um, look that is particularly beautiful that shows this the, the colors of Burgundy and their uh, and this new you know and, and proud and conscious and aware uh, ostentation of their own uh, identity and colors etc. 
Um, and by the way, all this um, heraldry played a great uh, important part because there were many complex codes uh, codes of behavior uh, attached, you know, under to, to the circumstances of tournaments, jousts, uh, jousts, etc. So th those were the best moments to show off. Right, and and also wearing this stuff as a, uh, the you know, the glory of your your house. And as we were saying before, the Burgundian um, dynasty produced some of the finest uh, knights of their times. Uh, what else can we say about the flags? We can say something about the flags. So first of all, um, the uh, much of those. Uh, heraldic um, picky dispositions um, rela um, re um, were about who could have the honor, the right, the privilege to to bear a type of flag. Right? Not everybody could do. That was an honor reserved to a few. By the way, tactically speaking, uh, whoever holds a, a banner is someone of great value. Normally, it's not just a guy who does that. Obviously, it's, it's kind of uncomfortable to fight in battle with with a banner instead than a shield, etc. But it was a, a great privilege, a great honor, and usually some of the most, <coughs> excuse me, com uh, warlike individuals and kind of even physically uh, apt individuals were chosen for this task. You have. I was reading just some days ago in some of these battles that the honor of bearing a flag was such that you some of these guys were killed on horseback, but they they found them, you know, dead, killed during the battle, but still on horseback and still with a corpse, still holding the banner because it was never to be let go. Probably was even tied or well, depending. Uh, I don't think so, but um, that really was to even to prove the. The, the loyalty. In fact, many battles were even uh, decided by sometimes uh, betrayals that passed through that, you know, the, the, the standard bearer may be betrayed because true, the, the flag on the ground, maybe this flag was broken and fell, etc. And banners were, flags were of, of crucial importance, naturally, for tactical maneuvers, for saying, you know, for, for even, in this case, measuring the um, health of a unit. Like, if the unit's wavering, it's being Aggressed violently, etc. If the, the flag falls, well, especially if this is the ones of uh, one of the commander, that's not a right, not a very good thing, right? And at this time, given the political fragmentation of the time, every man at arm kind of had his own uh, weapon. In 14th century Burgundy, uh, the the most basic uh, division was the one. So the uh, Chevalier Barchelier would carry up a pennon hmm, um, that was uh, usually a a long streamer, right? With uh, sometimes it was forked uh, at the ends, while the uh, Chevalier Banneret, so the the one who had the banners that were head of some uh, um, uh, more important. Um, uh, even if were a command of larger bodies of men, by the way, these were, were viscounts, counts, uh, marquesses, uh, in, uh, also the Marshal of Burgundy. So th this very, uh, you know, the, the, the first military uh, title of, of, of the duchy. Uh, also of um, other kind of um, usually minor figures that, however, were uh, of ever important, um, of ever growing importance, because they were at the head of specialized troops, uh, were had the right to carry a banner. For for instance, the maître de uh, Arbal des Arbalétriers, hmm? that is actually not just the master of of crossbowmen, probably the master of artillery, that kind of evolved in this kind of missile. Uh, Troops like you know passing from crossbow to, to firearms um, had to write to carry a banner. There was um, a nearly square flag, a big flag actually, right? So the pennant was like for the you know the individual noble, the knight, so whatever it was. These bigger figures who had more troops, were higher nobility, etc., had the privilege to to have the banner. 
It's a very a big squared flag. And princes and dukes instead could bear both the banner and the pennon, right? Uh, so, great privilege that probably has to do also with the larger bodies of troops that were under them, or at least there. Um, kind of that there is a you know people who served in this units were kind of also more had greater honor and they, they wanted to be recognized as well so as such and Philip the Bull's banner for example in 1386 measured um, two and a half on long and uh, one and a half on wide that as we said before it's roughly, roughly uh, you know uh, um, something uh, larger than uh, the excuse me a reading was say yeah and what we were saying here oh yeah that by the the 15th century instead especially banners and pennants uh, were starting to be um, uh, kind of more rarely carried part of the reason is that they, um, well, they were actually replaced by other types of flags, um, and that that seemingly complicate the story because um, you can find penonso, guidon, enseigne, etendard, uh, etc. And these are um, as difficult to to identify what they actually were, even that the, the, the types of medieval artillery that as we have seen on Schwerpunkt is a particularly difficult thing to, to frame because there is no scientificity to it. Every kind of source kind of decides which one it is, what 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 it equates to. But at least we can identify some differences. Um and the étendard w was usually so the standard that would be larger. Um even larger than banner actually and um the the pendants on guidon were, were smaller, usually forked. Uh, even the etendard could be f forked, but not quite in, uh, as always. But these are kind of very vague ideas we have. And uh, Philip the Bold had an etendard in 1386, which measured 16 on by 2.5 on. And the. Um, D. Another important difference in in this process is that um, the the banners and pennons usually bore their owners' official heraldic names, while pennons and atendard uh, bore the bear's personal emblems. Um, so it's um, it's very relevant because you, as we have you have you have seen, we have traced it that. that Kind of the first one were smaller, the one were bigger. So, uh, in other ways, <coughs> this um, what was represented on the f on, on these flags um, equated to who you were and who you were under, politically speaking, not just militarily speaking. So it's obvious that the ducal flag also in here was adopted, kind of you know reaching a, a greater importance and symbolizing now uh, the. In fact, w w when we were talking. Uh, a few time ago about the uh, I think it was about the flags of the um, Dutch uh, armies during the 16th to the 17th century and we're actually pretty close to it and there weren't many differences over time you realize that the trend was to have these larger standards especially at a company level to become larger right and the various pennants to become increasingly smaller and to eventually to disappear because it's as if there was a transition from the medieval system where it was kind of a set of so many different companies uh, for each they were kind of very small sometimes they were just uh, kind of a squad level pl platoon level and and the, they were all kind of equal importance because they all came from the various territories etc when the, the, state, the state kind of centralizes all the importance of these people kind of decreases they're kind of serving in a way or another for the, the state in a certain way and therefore it's kind of the statal 
flag that becomes larger and more important and this one disappear so this is the general trend it took centuries before it, it kind of came to an end <laughs> but um, it was still it was still to be found and even in the 15th century you can observe that this tra um, this uh, transformation was taking place already especially in armies such as these ones that were kind of more centralized at least administratively speaking and then, as we were explaining on the video on the Burgundian flags, uh, we have this um, very fortunate luck, albeit not for the poor Burgundians to to hi to have actually um, you know actual actual Burgundian preserved um, flags that were the ones captured by the Swiss during the years 1475, 1477, uh, after the terrible. Um, Burgundian defeats at their hand, and um, the and, and some of them were uh, the the were studied actually since that that time. I mean, during the seventeenth century, there were uh, scholars. Uh, I mean, researchers of some kind. They were kind of looking at them and trying to because actually the materials were decaying at that time. It was they were usually in silk or stuff like that. So. You, um, also, what was represented on them was kind of deteriorating. So there were some sc scholars who went there studying these things, and probably some of them were <laughs> these this banners were kind of ruined, ruined forever. So on these banners, we find uh, some of the most diverse. Uh, on one ba um, banner captured at Morat in 1476, there are the diagonal stripes of old Burgundy, the fleur de lis. Uh, of France, uh, the Red Lions of Brabant in Limburg, and the Black Lion of Flanders. And so you find this melange of uh, elements. So the old, you know, the stripes of, of Burgundy. So the, the, the fleur de lis is the French proper uh, symbol of, of, the, of the French monarchy proper uh, that was even at least still partly, you know, recognized as this even ambition to say, okay, we, we claim the throne, the throne of France, even as kind of, um, you know, at least as we, we fought against and we had this, but we're still part of them as well in some way. And Red Lions of Brabant and Limburg that were these parts of, uh, of, 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 uh, of Flanders that were conquered by the Burgundians and the Black Lion of, of, the, uh, of the old county of Flanders, by the way that the wor we were um, incidentally commenting on recently on the organization of Flemish armies during the or during the ele between the 11th and the 13th century um there are also many manuscripts showing us um the there is shilling uh glass that 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 show us this beautiful illuminations about the uh, Swiss wars, the Bur Swiss Burgundian wars. Uh, in the book of um, Glarus, uh, there are several details. For example, um, the uh, Bart uh, Saint Bartholomew as company saint. Mm -hmm. This was also uh, depicted on Burgundian flags, uh, holding the knife with which he was flayed. Mm -hmm. You know that um, military, so-called military saints, uh, or saints that were initially killed, mar uh, in fact martyrized, um, in, in a kind of a not really anti-militaristic uh, ideal, but you know, still differentiating the the secular sword from the spiritual one. Say, were eventually adopted uh, since antiquity into the Middle Ages as military saints per excellence, and every community at this point had their own saint, right? So it was normal, perfectly normal, to go to war with the mages of saint, of, of the virgin, of everyone, of, of these really important um, spiritual figures that um, were called upon to protect the army, of course. And, and every, every single community had a saint protector, aside from, obviously, the, the, the more widespread figures like, of course, um, like Virgin you know, or Jesus himself, etc. Um, so it was perfectly normal. And the so what else? There, there were so many other symbols. There were even a, a, a type of, of sort of numeration of the various banners that were ordered by the ordinance. 
um, uh, in, in sequence so they had to be recognized uh, not just by the colors but also by these uh, symbols, codes, uh, numbers if you want um, there are certain let's say difficulties even in trying to figure out what the the system kind of worked like and we have we don't have enough evidence unfortunately to to decipher it completely um, uh, other two company flags show um, uh, the uh, St. Uh, Peter and St. Andrew these were captured at Granson and Mora uh, respectively um, uh, the system of enumeration is not present in all the flags that we have actually and uh, at least from the one the, from the system that is taken from the flag book of Lucerne that uh, shows us this as well and the um, talking about what we said before relatively to the lesser uniformity of especially the crew personnel of artillery etc um, this was normal at the beginning also for one factor because initially the crews of artillery were were actually civilians like there is this kind of um, ambiguity or you know difficult understanding of what the difference between military and civilian is during the middle ages um, the important thing though is that initially the only uh, you know the, the best way to to field artillery and troops who knew how to man it was simply to hire the same uh, masters that uh, gunner masters that produced those guns you know that um, uh, we started now from the second half of the 14th century at that point the artillery was becoming barely uh, significant in tactically speaking um, so uh, and, and by the, the same one, one century after instead artillery was now a, a must for every updated uh, military force out there in Europe um, so even in here you have a transition from the master gunner that was just a uh, you know a, a, a craftsman fundamentally and instead specialized crew personnel that were usually directed by s this kind of masters of uh, of artillery etc. It may be civilians as well in this sense, may not be properly part of the army in terms of you know of, of, as a trooper but they were increasingly developing especially at this point in Renaissance times for um, for their military expertise at 360 degrees like they this didn't just know about bombers but they knew even about uh, fortifications and, and other um, abilities that this existed before we made a video about that during for the military engineers of the 13th century so that these professional uh, figures of military engineers start to appear pretty early but at this time obviously they start to be um, way more important very more valuable and therefore much better paid and um, and this is a period in in history where a lot of treatises and uh, other knowledge starts now circulating way more um, intensely and, and the debates on, on on the development of the military art start to 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 let's say enter into this uh, at least uh, presumption of scient scientificity like you know, there is uh, kind of a theoretical abstraction also t taking place, more mathematical studies, etc., that are thought to be applied. So, um, as a consequence, there is a better organization, a better, um, uh, more tr m more money invested, not just into the uh, production of, of artillery, but also in, in its maddening. And therefore, a degree of uniformity is to be found even in 2D artillery crews. Uh, they now are wearing kind of similar colors to the ones we have said before, blue, white, red, and all this stuff. And we have beautiful um, pictures of Swiss and Burgundian artillery, both on the march and in action from um, the Chronicle of the Swiss from Diebold Schilling and and uh, that contains this bu uh, fantastic uh, illustrations yeah if you ever 
if you ever have, we'll, maybe we'll use them some time else. We'll keep talking about the Burgundian army a lot. Um, okay, so another very important element of appearance is naturally uh, armor. Um, naturally, at this time, as we were saying, the, the, it's the moment of fullest development of of uh, of, fu of full plate armor, and uh, and although armor was used in part, uh, in uh, being painted or covered with textile, water clothes, um, with with color for, for with colors etc. to to be recognized, it's a, uh, in a kind of a uniform fashion. Still, many of these uh, armor could be. Uh, first of all, very variable in in fashion in some sort, um, but it's also complicated to talk about a specific national style. Like Bur Burgundy was a place that started producing his own armor uh, that you can find exported in many countries, even in England, etc. But now the dominating armor production was in Italy, so you find actually lots of Milanese style uh, armor that was sold basically lower Europe including to the Burgundian armies even uh, the Burgundians now had uh, made a use of, of, of full plate armor for horses as well mm. and uh, so the Burgundians were very rich they could buy the, f the best they go pick Milanese armor uh, there was also, also German ar so in southern Germany Bavaria also other centers were being in Tyrol also were start being produced uh, etc but still the the uh, Italians dominated the market uh, what else can we say that um, there were other varieties of, of, of outlook that at this point have nothing much to do with uniformity but for instance the, f the figures of the valets and the servants are important the valet was a kind of a kind of a, uh, of a squire proper was engaged into action the servant was kind of field aid like for mountain and trip etc um, and this had kind of different uh, equipment some of um, um, you know fine uh, armor and, uh, and clothing can be observed among the ballets who usually weren't um, weren't noble men but some of them could be um very well equipped actually i mean some of them could be actually noblemen themselves them themselves by but at this point it seemingly weren't the servants were also not or they were also known as pages page um they were definitely um uh, also um um they, c they could be as well as c commoners, but also sons of lesser gentlemen that s were sent to, especially to learn the court etiquette, because these people lived actually uh, following the the noblemen, so not just on the battlefield, but also elsewhere. So they were their aides in, in many ways, and uh, and and this could make for for a fine military training as well, learning both manners and warfare <laughs> at the same time. So good manners and, and ways to, to kill people uh, in once, which is uh, very <laughs> very intriguing. Um, so, yeah, but aside jokes, this this was the point. So, as you understand, even... Uh, I know that sometimes when I start talking about flags, uniforms, people say, oh, well, it's boring, but yeah, it kind of is if you, you know, if you like more straightforward stuff about tactics and combat, you know, uh, you know but it's kind of still part of it because at the end of the day um, everything that is worn is maybe not fully functional because we also should stop thinking that literally cent for cent of what is worn in battle is is kind of a rational or fully functional thing to but at the same time um, most of it is actually and, and therefore it all corresponds to to something that maybe if, even if it doesn't have to do with the strictly military uh, dimension is still it's comprehended by it in some obviously as it was worn by fighting men but also to tell us uh, um, tells us much about politics society and we can learn a big deal 
from that also about in turn the same military. So it's like a circle, right? Remember the Clausewitz in Trinity. And um, so concerning this, I hope that the the picture was clear, right? So never think that, that one day one guy woke up and decided to use vo uniforms. It's it was something very gradual was something dictated by several factors that intervened at the same time you see the, the same persistence of of uh, second-hand French uh, symbols into the Burgundian armies while the Burgundians were actually fighting against the King of France at that point into into the Hundred Years War but uh, it's, it's something that takes a lot of uh, time and also a lot of money by the way because you can't have this in 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 states that are not have do not have this degree of centralization, a kind of a medieval, a kind of militia like uh, military organization is to be found basically until the till very late even in, mo in the modern age, um, and therefore it's as if in this sense the Middle Ages never quite died. In as long as there is not a state that starts monopolizing very slowly, by very slowly, all the uh, military organization etc um, it, it all of this smaller elements are still a very important part of the uh, of the whole story you know uh, at this point we are talking quite a bit about this kind of early not just late medieval at this point but early modern um, military organizations and you see that the, the problems of the various European uh, monarchs were pretty much the same and the, the military was fundamentally di divided in this uh, before the, the the permanent armies proper starting from the, with Louis the fourteenth um, this, this statal professional permanent armies um, in France second half of the 17th century were basically a bunch of military co uh, of mercenary companies of um, of professionals that could be even maybe the same vassals of the king uh, but that were paid for it and were kind of the professionals and then a bulk of other levies that could be uh, usually uh, especially in the modern age it was a preference for uh, urban levies like so the ones that had also the tactical uh, ability and know-how to 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 provide for artillery uh, but also other logistical needs this is something that started very very early like as long as the urban communities developed in high medieval Europe in a consistent fashion it always backed the feudal monarchies in some ways from this especially logistical and financial as well point of view because at that point uh, a lot has uh, a lot has to do also uh, with how you draw the money and, and if you know what kind of of relation trees between you and these communities like and usually caching is much better than forcing these people to go fighting there because these people usually don't want to go fighting and maybe are the first ones who send money sending troops but at the same time there is a uh, you know sending troops of your own is still a way to to bargain certain political like if you if you draw uh, you know if I withdraw my troops you you know, you you the king can um, can suffer from this, so it's the campaign can go wrong. So it it, it was very complex and intertwined with well, the political gaming, and this was the real mess at the end of the day. So when we look at these armies, never think that it was kind of a scientific thing about finding out the right military system, tactical formula, etc. Was most way more important. Uh, in uh, from a strictly military point of view, all the political bargaining and, and, and the way of finding money, finding the, the troops. So sometimes these armies were fielded just as a consequence of very fortuitous um, elements. Uh, I made a video on the Burgundian army, uh, if you remember, the one on tactics, uh, looking at uh, some examples of, from these ordinances and, and, and or some uh, battle plans that were essentially... Uh, listing a series of 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 of, uh, of um, formations that were theoretically issued, but at the end of the day were not quite used, um, and therefore uh, even this dispositions that we have in forms of ordinances that tell us how it it had to be. It was also in here not necessarily how it really was. 
it was just a prescription to push towards that direction but then even unfortunately much of, of what really happened on the field is unknown um, and I think this, uh, this is important to, to, to grasp or at least even in this hyper detailed uh, controllable de details etc there is not really the the bigger you know you don't have to think that eventually these troops were commanded or organized in this meticulous fashion and everything was much more practical as in all armies right um, and this is important even at the level of doctrine because if you resume the question of why this system eventually collapsed you may say that maybe that there was something else that wasn't taken into account that was perhaps more important but whatever we will be keep talking about the Burgundian armies I'm happy that I made three videos up to this point about them so for now I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you are interested in my upcoming contents and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye